you up for no reason. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Hey, what do you do? I ain't gonna fucking break Hey everybody, welcome to Cop Watch Media's first ever uh, podcast episode. I'm here with my homeboy Ash. What's good? Uh, my name is Joe's Martha Rio. Um, you know, we we're happy to get this off the ground. Cop Watch Media is a grassroots media project uh, that we and others have started out to kind of counter a lot of the copaganda, a lot yeah. of the, the white supremacy based reporting that we see in the world um, from the local level to the national level. Uh, and we want to build a, a, an alternative model uh, for, uh, you know, communities of color by writers and, and, and people from communities of color. Um, and we want to do something to kind of counter propaganda and also give the ability of the community to be able to tell their own stories. Um, so happy to guys join us. Ash, you got any? Yeah, well, yeah, basically another thing I want to add to what you just said is like uh, we basically want to have young black and brown people writing about their own communities, writing about cops in their own communities. A lot of the, like you said, a lot of the newsrooms we run into, The Guardian, Bloomberg, whatever, are just filled with white people, essentially. Those newsrooms, you know, cubicles full of white people talking about our communities, how the cops treat us, and framing it in ways that we wouldn't frame it, obviously. So basically we want to have, you know, people who aren't gentrifiers, young black and brown people from their communities talking about how the cops treat them from their perspective. And eventually, you want to kind of hand off this website to young black and brown people who can, who can continue this work uh, after we're done. Because you and I, we're both getting kind of old at this point now, too. Long uh, in the twos. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, basically, in the future, uh, we want to have people to hand the site off to and have them run it and have them continue this cop watching work, have, have them continue criticizing, being skeptical of authority, being skeptical of the DAs, the cops, the courts. Uh, all these systems that basically make our lives miserable every day and impoverish our communities um, and, yeah, and inflict violence on us every freaking day. So, yeah. Absolutely. And it's called Cop Watch Media also to kind of give a tip of the hat to a lot of the, the media work that's already been happening, continues to happen this day, yeah. from cop watchers, people who film police, exactly. community members who take it upon themselves to take a camera, whether it's on their phone uh, or, uh, you know, on a, on a GoPro to go out and film police and what they do. And as you guys have seen for the last few years, that has ultimately been the starting point for movements, Black Lives Matter movement, yeah. movements for justice, yeah. um, is when we see that uh, evidence on film um, that allows people to take to the streets. So we want to continue in that tradition. A tip of the hat to the cop watchers out there. Right. Tip of the hat to media makers who are not recognized as, com as media makers, which is us, people who live in these communities that are being, over, the, being hyper policed. Um, and really, that's what Cop Watch Media stands for. Yeah, definitely. We have to give a shout out to the cop watchers who've been doing this work long before us. Um, the been guys have been doing it since VHS days, like our colleague Dennis Flores. Uh, been, you know, carrying around big ass cameras, trying to record the police. So we're definitely not the first ones to do this kind of work. We're not the first ones to kind of highlight this kind of work. But there have been people who've been, you know, on the streets, taping the police, catching them on camera, catching them doing dirt long before us. And we've got to give a big shout out to them. And, and the people, young people today who are still doing that work today with their phones. Uh, big shout out to them because they're the real people we want to, like, highlight and emphasize in this work that we're doing. We're, we're just talking about what they're doing, but they're doing the actual work. So we wanted to start off our first podcast over kind of taking a, a, a look at some of the stuff that's been on our website, copwatch.media. If you go to it, um, you can kind of see some of the articles that have come up in, in, uh, in July. Um, two of those pieces that actually uh, have been published in, in July were written by our own uh, Ash. Um, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about what the, you know, what the pieces were about, yeah. um, you know, what led you to write about these stories, mm -hmm. um, and really kind of what maybe it sheds a light on, on some of the issues in New York City happening right now. Yeah. Uh, I guess let's talk about the first bigger, larger article about um, the way NYC Parks cops, the Parks Enforcement Patrol, mm -hmm. which is part of NYC Parks Department, uh, basically 
have been harassing people in parks all across New York City, especially this summer. It's I, I the way I started this article, the way I started wanted to write this article is basically, I mean, what we do, we're cop watch media, so I follow cop watchers on social media. I follow um, Steve Cruz. I follow Washington Park, Washington Park SOS on IG. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times in the morning, I, they're kind of like my morning newspaper, essentially. I scroll mm-hmm. and see what they're put, what videos they're putting up and kind of trying to get a keep an ear to the street that way, essentially. Right. And so, like, last year, for example, uh, in Washington Square Park, there was a big crackdown by the NYPD on the park goers in Washington Square Park. There were nights where cops would come, NYPD cops would come in riot gear and eventually and essentially kick out all the park goers. Uh, there were arrests. There were um, pretty much bottle stoned by park goers as well. There's a, a few nights where there was that back and forth. And so I talked about that last year in an article and basically how the New York Post and local New, uh, New York City media essentially helped demonize the park goers and, and help give the cops justification for cracking down on, you know, regular, mostly black and brown, also some NYU college students, homeless folks, vendors who are the regulars in, in Washington Square Park and make that park what it is. Give that park the culture that it's known for. Um, and, you know, at the behest of local affluent white residents, um, the cops came and cracked down on them. And basically, you know, these local rich white people, they didn't like the noise. They didn't like seeing homeless people. They didn't like seeing people smoking blunts. They didn't like seeing people skateboarding, all that stuff. And so... You know, they sick the cops on people. So that was last year, basically. It was mostly the NYPD. But this year, I noticed there's more NYC Parks Enforcement Patrol, who are yeah. NYC Parks cops, essentially. Uh, and I noticed Steve Cruz and Washington, Spark, Washington Park SOS, Washington Square Park SOS, posting a lot of videos about NYC Parks cops going up to vendors and, and targeting them and, and, you know, threatening them with tickets and, or threatening with calling the NYPD on them. Uh, or I noticed um, the crackdown on skateboarders too, or especially the crackdown on homeless people. So I saw that happening, and I noticed like a, a definite uptick in the way the NYC Parks cops were acting. Mm-hmm. Uh, the NYPD had taken more of a backseat, and especially after last year, it kind of made the NYPD look bad to be like cracking down on these park goers. Gothamist came out with an article maybe earlier this year, late last year, about showing the emails. Mm, from that's right. yeah. the Washington Square Park Conservancy, which is this essentially this group of rich white people who live in that neighborhood, yeah. emailing the, Wash- the New York City Parks Department and getting in contact with NYPD and complaining, essentially, about these park goers. Uh, so NYPD started taking a little bit more of a back seat recently this summer, which, what, which was what I noticed. And um, yeah, so I noticed the green uniform NYC Parks cops taking more of a front seat when it comes to cracking down on them. Uh, Ash, let me ask something about Washington Square Park because yeah. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Washington Square Park always had a reputation. Yeah. Um, I'm sure was, there was been years of police trying to crack down on people in the park for whatever reasons. It has its own reputation. But yeah. was there any significance or was there anything diff- specific about Washington Square Park in con- in contrast to um, the George Floyd protests or the pandemic? What was it about Washington Square Park where it became kind of a source for you know, a lot of people being in the park and then also police cracking down on those people. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why um, there was so much attention and so much going on in Washington Square Park last year is because, you know, the pandemic restrictions were kind of easing up or whatever. People were going outside more and people were congregating much more in Washington Square Park, especially young people. Uh, There were outdoor parties. That was one of the things that was driving uh, the noise complaints, I guess. Uh, There were young people were going on TikTok, going on social media, seeing that there was parties going on in Washington Square Park and would all kind of flock to the park. It was a nice outdoor space, uh, very wide outdoor space, so there's a lot of places to go. It would be like around that fountain in Washington Square Park, mm-hmm. there'd be maybe like two or three different parties going on at the same time, as well as like, you know, there would be a section where the homeless folks would just chill and stuff like that. There would be a section where like activists would mostly chill. Uh, There's another thing, um, you know, after 2020, uh, a lot of Newer people came out who started protesting more. A lot of the newer activists started coming out. They were younger people, too. Yeah. They came out to start partying and start, you know, cop watching and chilling in the park and networking with each other as well. So you had all these groups. And then also the NYU students, local students coming out. So you had all these, like, different groups of, like, people who the cops usually crack down on, basically. Students, young people, activists, yeah. homeless people, yeah. vendors, people who do drugs and stuff like that. 
all these different groups coming together and just basically like trying to enjoy themselves outside during the nice weather, essentially, right? Uh, and the one thing about that is like all those groups are seen as nuisance groups by yeah. the local white, rich white people as well, too. So yeah. like you had this almost a perfect storm, essentially, of like all the groups that like the rich and the cops hate. <laughs> yeah. Coming together, trying to have a good time by in the themselves. middle of Manhattan. Yeah, in the middle of Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, and then so like you know this could not could not be allowed to happen essentially. Yeah. Uh, so like yeah, and then, so last year is when the big NYPD crackdowns happened. But like after maybe a month where NYPD was hands off, after like the major crackdowns, uh, there was a major crackdown maybe I think in early June last year. And then the mayoral candidates commented on the fact that NYPD was chasing people out the park, arresting people, and it made the NYPD look bad. And especially, even Eric Adams at one point condemned mm. basically what the NYPD did and said, like, you know, I don't think we should be scheduling, you know, confrontations between the cops and park goers, you know, every night because of a curfew that was uh, imposed on the park. Uh, so, like, maybe for, like, the month of June, NYPD was relatively hands-off. But during that month, the New York, New York Post and local NYC media, the TV, especially TV news, were going hard on saying like every little incident that happened in the park was like blown up and sensationalized yeah. to be like the worst con- crime ever happening. Oh my goodness, these these young people are partying and like they're fighting with each other, stabbing each other. Oh my goodness, this this increase in crime, and that's why we should definitely get the cops back to impose this curfew. So after that month, essentially, um, and the NYPD had like a, a fake community meeting where they kept out the young people and let in the older, rich, white people, uh, and then basically used that, that community meeting to be like, you see, the community wants us to crack yeah. down on these park goers. See, the, this is what the, we're just doing what the community it's wants community by the cracking down. And then after that, they had another community meeting, which is what wasn't run by the NYPD, uh, which was run, I think, by the local community uh, precinct board, pre- community board precinct or whatever. Council. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where there were more young people, where actually the young people who go to the park did get in, and they were the majority in that hearing, uh, and they kind of like overshadowed the the rich white people complaining about them, uh, but that didn't get a, that didn't get that didn't get much attention, as much attention. That was considered like oh, young people being rowdy at the hearing and stuff like that. That wasn't the community speaking. That wasn't framed as that way. It was framed as like these young people invading the the hearing essentially. So that. The NYPD didn't listen to that, that community. Yeah. At that point, the NYPD didn't want to listen to community. So, essentially, there was a, a curfew reimposed in the park, uh, which is in place to this day. The cops kick out people at midnight, essentially, in the park. And so, like, a lot of the stuff that was happening last year kind of died down still. There's still, like, parties in the park and stuff like that. Mm. But the, the freedom <laughs> was severely limited, essentially. Uh, and, you know, the vendors were cracked down on, speakers and music, loud music yeah. was cracked down a lot. So the park this year was kind of not as good as it was last year. It wasn't as popular as last year, for sure. And on that point, on vendors, yeah. by the way, uh, you know, stay tuned, because speaking about crackdowns in parks, yeah. uh, you know, the famously in New York, if you're a New York City resident, you heard about the, you remember, might remember the Tompkins Square Park riots. Yeah. We will be having some, one of our, one of our members has something coming out soon about uh, the Tompkins Square riots, but uh, on that point about vendors, the anniversary of which we just celebrated the, other the anniversary yeah. of which, right, right, and there's a whole whole bunch of history there to talk about. But mm-hmm. on that point about vendors, which mm-hmm. you know, vendors sell in the parks, right? Because mm-hmm. there's people in the parks. Yeah. Um, you also wrote a piece, uh, a piece about Sunset, which is your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, regarding vendors and um, some local elected officials, tell us a little bit about that piece. Well, well, well also the thing with the Square Park and the vendors, and also with the other article, it wasn't just Washington Square Park. I just wrote about right. uh, Union Square. I wrote about. I, I interviewed a, a ventriloquist, a guy who got cracked down on in Union Square. He just does a little puppet show in Union Square, mm-hmm. and he had a speaker on. NYC Parks cops came and threatened him with a ticket. Until people kind of gathered around, including cop watchers, and kind of defended him essentially. What are my rights? What are my rights? I think for what? For what? It's off. I could be here, bro. It's not on, bro. Hey, it's all good. Hey. Oh, hold on. It's all good. Nah, y'all listen. You hear me? 
I don't know if you remember me. I'm Cop Watch. Remember you did a little video on me? Yeah. Anyway, I'm full of people. I'm, I'm recording the whole shit. When they came up on you, it wasn't even on, bro. Exactly. I have it on video. Don't worry about it. Just oh, do what you got to do. And then also I wrote about uh, in that article, uh, in, during the Mermaid pa Parade in Coney Island, there was a churro lady and uh, the New York City Parks cops kind of cracked down on her and then a, a crowd gathered around them. How to almost start a riot at the Mermaid Parade by the New York City Parks Department. Number one, penalize the poor for trying to make a living. Number two, throw perfectly good food away during a recession. Number three, smile and mock the crowd while doing it. And number four, Make sure it's during a time of celebration. Meanwhile, the NYPD enjoys similar vendor food down the boardwalk. And almost started like, almost started a little confrontation between the people watching and, and the NYC box cops. There were people actually trying to like grab the her cart because they the the park cops were about to take away her cart and stuff that they did end, end up taking her cart away. Let and that be a lesson there. Like that's the one thing you fuck with the churro ladies. People come out. Yes, yeah, yeah. Don't for fuck real. with the churro ladies. And yo, as people, a rule, people got very angry and yeah. people were, and were chanting quit your. These were like activists and stuff like that. These were just regular, regular people, people chanting at the Murmur Parade. You know what yeah. I mean? And Mermaid, for anyone who doesn't know, Mermaid Parade is just when people just go out and dress like mermaids and literally march in Coney Island. That's all they do. Yeah. So it's not like freaking, you know, police abolition. Yeah, as people, a rule. People got very angry and yeah. people were, and were chanting, quit your job. These were like activists and stuff like that. These were just regular, regular people chanting at the Mermaid Parade. You know what I mean? And Mermaid, for anyone who doesn't know, Mermaid Parade is just when people just go out and dress like mermaids and literally march in Coney Island. That's all they do. Yeah. So it's not like freaking, you know, police abolitionists or anything. These are just regular folks trying to have a good time mm -hmm. in Coney Island. And so, like, they cracked down the churro lady and then people gathered around and got very angry and started, like, trying to pull the cart away from them and stuff like that. It almost got out of hand for a second. Uh, but, and also, like, one thing, that the, cop, the cop watchers who recorded the, that video of the NYC Parks cops cracking down the churro lady also, you know, noticed that down the boardwalk, the cops are also eating the same kind of food that the vendors would be selling. The same vendors that they cracked down on, those cops will eat the food from there, but then take your cart away and stuff like that. So yeah, I just want to emphasize that it wasn't just Washington Square Park in my article. It was places, public spaces citywide mm. that NYC Parks cops were cracking down on true ladies, you know, and freaking park goers and stuff like that. A ventriloquist, a guy with a literal puppet who does like, you know, a little funny comedy show on the side of Union Square Park. Yeah, got cracked down, and and what his his name is Nigel Dunkley, by the way. He's an IG. He said that was the first time he ever got messed with for a speaker. He said like in years past, like even NYPD would like pass by him and be like, okay, he's just a puppeteer, you know, let him be, let him be. He was like, earlier this summer was the first time he ever got cracked down on and threatened with a ticket, just for you know doing a puppet show, doing a goddamn puppet show. So wow. yeah, I want to emphasize that. But so tell us about that uh, vendor piece. Uh, so yeah, in Washington Square Park and in, in Sunset Park, uh, in the actual park, uh, in the neighborhood of Sunset Park, um, there's a group of vendors and organizers who get together every Sunday during the warmer months of the year. Uh, it's called Plaza Tonatia. Uh, and basically, it started last year in March with about like eight vendors and the organizers getting together. And they basically, they just wanted a, a safe place in the park where they could sell their stuff, basically. And they sell like food, like, you know, maybe crafts and clothing, little things like that that you see on the table, that you fit on the table, basically. Uh, but before, like a little before then, those vendors in the park were getting fucked with by the NYC Park cops and by NYPD and stuff. So they kind of realized, like, look, let's band together and maybe there'll be power in numbers. If we all stick together, we can, we can kind of repel this harassment mm -hmm. and, and stop it from happening. And so it, it worked La late last year, uh, early last year in March, 2021, I believe they started with like eight vendors and it's only grown since then. Now it's like, I, I couldn't even, I went there last week and I couldn't even like count the amount of vendors. It was like definitely more than 20. 
like mm. a good amount of vendors out there uh, and they're all sticking together um, so earlier this year in early in the summer I noticed um, Mexicanos Unidos who's the organizing group who like helps put it together essentially uh, put out put out a video on the Plaza Tanatia IG page of them essentially repelling NYC Parks cops who are uh, uh, harassing a vendor over a, a permit or something like that mm. uh, and basically they all stuck together and they're like yo you're not doing this today no you're not messing with us today and so you see in the video you see an NYC Parks cop get back in their vehicle and like drive away essentially mm. and I saw that video I was like oh shit like they're really doing it in the park like they're, they're, there's proof of concept right there like they stuck together they stood their grounds whatever and the cop went away, basically. Uh, and then, so that put me, that, that put them on, on my radar. So like, oh shit, this, I, I need to start like paying attention to what's going on. I might have to write something about this. You're leaving, miss. Pain, you're leaving. You should get in your car, miss. Y'all leaving today. Y'all are leaving. We're not leaving. Nosotros no nos vamos. Son ellos los que se van a ir. Nosotros no nos vamos. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. What really made me start writing the article is um, they did a demonstration at a local politician's office. Mm. Uh, the organizers and the vendors got together and they did like just them. They didn't make an open call for people to join them. It was just the people in that that plaza who put it together. The vendors and organizers all marched down to uh, Alexa Vilas's uh, office in Sunset Park. That's for our readers. That's the, the local city council, city council member. member. Yeah. And um, basically, they marched to her office, uh, spoke outside her office. And basically, when I interviewed one of the organizers, a guy named Leo, who at, Me who at Mexicanos Unidos, mm -hmm. he made sure to tell me, he was like, look, it wasn't even necessarily, we, tr we weren't trying to necessarily be hostile towards Alexa. It's not about her, really. But it's about, you know, us putting pressure on local elected officials to, like, take a side openly. Yeah. Choose a side. Whose side are you on? You're on the cop's side or you're on our side? Uh, are you going to defend us? Are you going to stand up for us, at least rhetorically? And so they went to her office. They spoke outside. She wasn't there at the time, supposedly. But uh, they marched back to the park after that demo. And maybe like maybe 20, 30 minutes afterwards, she showed up at the park mm. and, and spoke to them and kind of tried to reassure them like she's on their side, essentially. Right. But um, so basically, yeah, I went and asked her some questions about it. And um, the organizers' demands are very modest, too, actually. One of the demands is like, in the park, there's a bathroom uh, that gets closed at like maybe a five or six. And in the summertime, everyone knows the sun goes down like maybe eight or nine. And Plaza Tanatia maybe stops uh, at maybe eight. And they wrap up all the vending tables and stuff like around eight or nine. So there's like a few hours where like there's no bathroom for people to use. And, but even though there's a lot of people at the park. And there was actually one confrontation between one of the, the park's employees, uh, an NYC park cop, who was closing the bathroom and a vendor who was trying, a woman vendor who was trying to use the bathroom. And that caused a whole thing where the NYC Parks cop was about to call the NYPD on the vendors. For using for, the bathroom? For trying to use the bathroom, yeah. For, for arguing like, yo, let me use the bathroom. I, I know you're trying to close it now, but please, let me just use it right now real quick. And so, you know, very modest demand. I'm like, please, just open the bathrooms up for a few more hours so people in the park can use the bathroom. That's a very modest demand. Another demand is basically trash pickup. There's a lot of vendors selling food and stuff like that. And so there's more trash, and there's more people in the park, and there's more trash. Another very modest demand they made is, like, just pick up the trash more. That's it, in the park, so we can, like, have a cleaner park. Like, things, very material, small demands that benefit everybody in the community, essentially, right? And not just the people, the vendors, and the organizers in that part of the park, but everyone who goes to the park will benefit from increased pe trash pickup. So basic necessities, like using the bathroom and having a clean park, and yeah. instead they're being met with police repression. Well, the police repression kind of precedes all that, and it, and those demands come out of the police repression too. Um, like I said, there was confrontation over the bathrooms. Um, one of the things that they, people try to mess with them about, and people try to call the cops on them about, is 
they they leave so much trash around. Oh my goodness, they're trash in the park. A lot of they did the same thing in Washington Square Park too. When they when local white people would say, yeah. "Look, when they have these parties, they trash the park." Oh my god, the New York Post would put pictures of trash in the park. Like, oh my goodness, there's so much trash, and that's why the cops got to come and crack heads. I always feel there's always like a subtle insinuation they're trying to say like they're dirty they're dirty <laughs> they're, dirty. Yes, they're exactly. trash yes, without yeah. saying that they're these trash these people are dirty yes yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly like, the get situation. this trash out of here yes, oh exactly. do you mean the trash you mean the people the people exactly right. yeah, no yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it is yeah uh, so yeah I mean, and then so those and the, those two demands as well as you know keep the police off our backs essentially for these things yeah. Where essentially there are three demands: the organizer and the vendors' three demands to to Alexa Vilas, and the three demands in general, essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, so I asked Alexa uh, what she could do, uh, and I try to be very gentle with her. So you reached out to her office. Yes, I reached out to her office, and I try to be gentle with her because the organizer said this isn't about Alexa. This we're not being hostile to her or anything like that. We don't want this to be a story about you know us attacking her specifically. This is us you know trying to get. Concrete They're demands asking for met. their elected official to do their job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're kind of trying to get, get concrete demands met by any means. Mm. And we're going to reach out to elected officials to see if they can do that, provide that you know, for the yeah. constituents, for the community. Yeah. Uh, and basically, she just told me uh, that she doesn't have much power to do anything. Mm. Uh, but she can, you know, work to try to get the garbage picked up more. The small things she could work to do. But when it comes to the cops, she has no juice, essentially, right? She can't do mm. nothing about the cops. And like... I don't. I, I. That's pretty much what I expected, essentially, right? The cops. She. She's one of those politicians that kind of like tries to portray herself as progressive and stuff like that, and, and, and that's the the best way to get cops to hate you, essentially, right? To be like, okay, we're not gonna listen to this person. And uh, folks at home should know, you know, New York City is an area where like nine out of ten of the elected officials will call themselves a progressive, mm-hmm. right? And you know, we've organized in this city for a while. Yeah. We've been around like. More often than not, that's just a bunch of bullshit. It's just and, promotion, and, yeah. And so. it's just, you know, for them to get ahead in their careers in New York City, yeah. you know, it's a buzzword. But there's also a history in Sunset of a lot of shenanigans with street vendors. I know our, our partners over at El Grito have done a lot of organizing around this in years past mm-hmm. where cops have beat up vendors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a history here. There's also a history of the local elected official who preceded Avila as really kind Menchaca. of not doing Call shit. Us Menchaca, Menchaca. Not doing, yeah. Not really doing shit or like giving awards to some of the some of the cops yeah. that beat up people Call in the Carlos Menchaca used to always, you know, he was a queer Mexican politician. He used to love putting that up for yeah. it as proof that it, of his progressiveness or whatever. Right. But I remember one time there was a city council hearing where James O'Neill was testifying and Carlos Menchaca was fawning over James O'Neill because he had a colorful tie and stuff like that. <laughs> like complimenting his tie like, oh my God, you look great today. Oh my goodness. Like, and like, why are you kissing this cop's ass when you're supposed to be the progressive, you know, city council member for Sunset Park, uh, an area that get where people get fucked with by the cops like crazy, yeah. and you're here complimenting the cop on his tie, uh, a protege of Bill Bratton, no less too. James O'Neill yeah. was, yeah. you know, Bill Bratton's personal pick to to, to, to succeed him, succeed right. him. Right. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a long po- uh, history of like New York City politicians proclaiming to be progressive, but it really doesn't mean anything. But nonetheless, just Saying that out loud will make the NYPD, especially the cop unions, essentially like peg you as an enemy yeah. uh, and say like, you know, crazy socialist, Marxist, you know, politician who wants to, you know, mm-hmm. get, you know, tell the police to stop cracking down on you and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ash. Well, I also wanted to t- take time to also kind of acknowledge a couple of the more recent pieces that come on the, on the website, two uh, op-eds that we had um, from young young people in, in uh, Red Hook, Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, Kiara Turner and Knowledge Westbrooks. Um, they're both residents of Red Hook Houses in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, they wrote our first ever guest submissions for the, for the website. Um, Knowledge wrote a, a kind of like a, a broad piece about kind of the criminal justice system in general from his point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, we published that uh, just at the end of July. And Kiera's piece, which we just uh, published a few days ago, um, which you can both see, you guys can both access them on the website now, uh, was talk, started talking about some of her experience with school safety agents, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, wrongfully, you know, searching her at school. Um, and kind of what her, she feels in terms of like her lack of trust in police overall. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about these pieces was them talking about their personal experiences with yeah. the cops. What made them start thinking the way they start, with the way they think now, essentially, um, which was really powerful. And I hope we get to speak with them and talk about their experiences soon. Definitely. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, on that tip, also, I just wanted to just put out there, um, you know, we're, we're, we put out a call for pitches um, this week. Um, if you have ideas for stories that either you want to report on, um, you have analysis on, or you have a first person perspective, like from your, from your point of view, we are looking for uh, pitches. Um, you can check out our, our Twitter page. There's a, there's a Google form that you can fill out um, in order to, to pitch us. Uh, we really want to focus on writers of color, specifically young people, yes. and specifically people who live in these communities that are being hyper police, yeah. public housing, um, low income, black and brown neighborhoods. Those are the, the pitches we're really looking for. So yeah, and, uh, and I want to emphasize, even though we're based in New York and a lot of our articles are about New York, it doesn't have to be people from New York. You can be from L.A., Chicago, wherever city you're from, in the U.S.A., in the world, even if you know, freaking white supremacy and state violence is a worldwide uh, phenomenon. So like. You know, wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in the U.S., uh, if you're a young black or brown person, please, like, you know, write for us and tell us about how the cops are treating your community. Yep. Or it doesn't have to be written either. Heck, it can be, you know, a photo essay, video piece, be an audio piece, whatever. Um, we're open to all types of, you know, all types of media. Um, we just want to get the voices that need to, be vo need to be out there, out there, essentially, so... All right, now uh, the section of the podcast where we want to get a little bit into uh, copaganda. We'll call mm. the copaganda report, right? Yeah, yeah. Copaganda, for anybody who doesn't know, Ash, how would you describe copaganda? Basically, any kind of media that like frames the police as a, ne as a necessary institution uh, and even sometimes as, as a benevolent institution. Um, you know, New York Times to New York Post and basically all mainstream media uh, kind of take it for granted that we need the cops to be safe. Uh, and... The way they talk about the cops kind of like you can see the underlying assumptions being made when the way they talk about the cops as if like as if the cops keep us safe or as if they're needed uh, or when it comes to New York Post as if, you know, the cops are angels of light who like, you know, who only beat people because they need to be beaten and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, that's copaganda, essentially. Copaganda can also be about crime, right? Because the, 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 the idea is that the more that you pump up crime... Um, you make police more valuable or you make it seem like policing is inevitable and necessary. Mm -hmm. So on that tip, the, the, the one thing I think I want to start to talk about was this Bloomberg um, story that came out on their website um, about crime and about mm -hmm. crime perceptions. And this is something that we've, you know, Ash and I probably tweeted about it for years. Mm -hmm. People have been starting to talk about copaganda more now, uh, especially on social media. Like that word has probably picked up a lot more in the last couple of years as people kind of start to see not just police, but also kind of larger parts of society that are feeding into what police are doing. Um, but anyway, this article uh, uh, was called Fear of Rampant Crime mm -hmm. is Derailing New York City's Recovery. Um, it was published that on the 29th. Um, the authors are Fola Kanivi and Raida Wahid, if I'm not mispronouncing those names. Um, the article got a lot of buzz on social media. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there was a there was a graph that was shared by a lot of people. Um, basically, the story was about crime and perception of crime during the Adams administration, and then they, there was a section about perceptions of crime versus actual crime. And uh, I think we might be able to throw it up on screen uh, if you're watching on the video. But mm -hmm. the graph essentially showed you know crime kind of going up and down. Um, you know, maybe spiking a little bit right after the pandemic, um, but coverage of crime, uh, and they looked at digital stories uh, of crime in New York City, um, went up, you know, tenfold beyond what was actually any increases in crime. So the graph really kind of laid out visually for people how much coverage has gone up versus how much crime has gone up, um, the little bit that's gone up. And they also started out the article saying like, even if the crime numbers have gone up, you know, here and there from, you know, month by month, um, they're still historically low compared to mm -hmm. the 90s or even the early 2000s. So uh, the story was was good. Right. So we'll start off with yeah. a good example, but that talks about copaganda because it mm -hmm. talks about this perception. Right. And yeah. who creates perceptions, the media. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is a really good starting off point to kind of everybody take a bird's eye view of what's happening. So not just what the stories are and not just how bad the stories are written or how you know generous they are to the cops, but just the overall amount of stories that you're seeing and how it pounds people in the head. So if you hear constant crime, constant crime, mm -hmm. right? An average everyday New Yorker or an average everyday person in, in this country mm -hmm. is gonna be slowly pushed into this idea that we're not safe. And yeah. then the idea is that police make us safe. 
Yeah. I mean, one part of the article says, um, three quarters of New Yorkers said crime was a very serious problem in a February Kinnipiac University poll. That's the highest number since the question was first asked in 1999 when the murder rate per capita was 50% higher. Back then, only 35% of respondents ranked violence as a major concern. So like, like you said, like back in the days, 80s and 90s, when, when violence and crime was, was much, much higher, much less people said it was their main concern. Uh, but now, where crime is at, is still at historic lows, and they say that in the article, that crime is still at historic lows in New York City uh, because of you know, sensationalized media coverage of crime, uh, much, much more people, the, the highest number they ever had in the Kinnipiac poll since they started asking the question, are saying crime and violent crime are, are a very serious concern for them. Right. Um, and then part of the article also showed that like, in the lead up to Eric Adams' uh, election, and especially right after he got sworn in, uh, the coverage of crime went way up, basically. So like, kind of shows like the way the media kind of paved the way for Eric Adams to get into office firsthand. And then once he gets in, his big thing is obviously like, I'm going to solve crime. I'm here to solve crime. So they, they essentially follow his direction and kept reporting on crime. We're going to talk about crime since Eric Adams wants to talk about crime. We're going to talk crime like crazy. Yeah. And that's when it really spikes when he gets into office. Well, you, you, you get an echo chamber here. And this is what I've seen happens with, with, with mayors. I'm old enough to be around you know, the Giuliani era, the Bloomberg mm-hmm. era. So you have the media whose job it is to report on what's happening in the city and who's the biggest you know, voice in the city is the mayor. He has, mm-hmm. the, he has the bully pulpit, he has the biggest platform, he holds press conferences. Mm-hmm. What, anything that comes out of his mouth can become news on any given day. Yeah. So you have the media looking for a story about crime and then you have a mayor who's talking about crime all the time. And so they feed off of each other. And so the media is happy to have a mayor who's talking about crime. This is an old saying, if yeah. it bleeds, it leads, right? Mm-hmm. Media stories, fear is a great way to get clicks, yeah. right? Um, and then you have a mayor who's talking about crime because he's trying to say that I'm the I'm the medicine, you know, mm-hmm. I'm the antidote for this problem that New York City is incur- having right now. Um, they don't mention the pandemic, have you know, yeah. the effects on people's lives, yeah, on the economy, that. on people's living, mm-hmm. on their mental state, yeah. any of that stuff. That stuff is not talked about. It's just crime. Mm-hmm. They talk about it in this vacuum, and then you have this echo chamber between media and the, and the mayor. So the mayor goes back and forth, he gets a, gets a, the, the, the writers at a, at a New York Post or, or PIX11, or these are some of our local stations here in New York City, they have a story they can run with. And it's pretty simple, you just show up, you put a mic in front of the mayor's mouth, and you have a story, right? You don't mm-hmm. have to do any investigating, talking to people, anything like that. So this has happened while the mayor has been in office, mm-hmm. and this, you know, Kudos to these two reporters. They looked and they've seen it. They said it's not actually in line with reality. It's not yeah. even in line with the data that mm-hmm. comes from the NYPD itself. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know this, which I, is suspect in the first place too. Which, which, I which want is to suspect emphasize. in the yeah. first place, but even them, you know. Yeah. Um, so you have this perception issue, and the one thing I want to just say about this perception issue, it's it's not just a perception issue. Where is that perception happening? Yeah. It's a media issue. Exactly. I'm not getting perceptions of crime. Most people are not experiencing crime in their everyday lives, right? Yeah. Maybe some some are, but most aren't. You know, um, where the perceptions happening? They're coming from when you go near your bodega and you see a newspaper headline. They're coming when you go home and you just you know at the end of the day you throw on the TV and there's four or five stories about crime right after another, mm-hmm. and you get inundated with this stuff over and over, beat over the head with it, and then eventually you're like, wow, man, we're really not safe. Mm-hmm. Whereas like I'm old enough to remember 20 years ago, like you know. That was actually a not safe time in New York City, if I could say so. But mm-hmm. we have like a fraction of that crime now. Exactly. So yeah. the issue is not perception of crime. It's who is creating perception, and that's mm-hmm. the media. So you have a media problem. So the story mm-hmm. is about perceptions, but it's really a media problem. And ironically, this is Bloomberg News. So mm-hmm. um, the yeah. media was able to actually <laughs> exactly. take a look at yeah. itself for <laughs> once and say like, hey, <laughs> you know, we're causing some of the problems. Uh, and this story was pretty good. So we'll start off on that point. That but, was... But also, uh, when, when it comes to Eric Adams, the funny thing is, like, after him's constant drum beating about crime and crime and crime, uh, there was a point maybe a month or two ago where he started blaming the media for not giving him credit and making it se- making the city seem dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so he wants credit for saving the city, essentially, uh, even though the, the, the media still, you know, the inertia from the, the increase in crime reporting uh, is still going on. Uh, he, want, he wants the, the credit for it as, as a savior. He wants to be known as the savior and the person who's going to come and fix things. But since the crime reporting is still going on, 
Uh, and Eric Adams is still the mayor, and people are starting to blame him, and his popularity is going down. Uh, then he started blaming, essentially, the media, saying, like, oh, you guys are just focused on the bad things. Why don't you focus on the good things? This so it's really, it's, like, really ironic, like, for him to, like, complain about media coverage of crime uh, when he's the main reason for it, and he benefits the most from it. He's, he's the mayor because of that. Uh, but then when it, when it doesn't fit his agenda, when it doesn't benefit him, then he's the first one to start complaining about, you know, crime coverage and, and start talking about, the, you know, the city is actually pretty safe. It's just perception and blah, blah, blah. We could do an entire yeah. website and podcast, several podcasts around this dude. Yeah. This dude is, is, a, is a cartoon yeah. in many ways of some of the worst tendencies in, in New York City's politics. But and, and also, the, I want to really quickly about the, the way that article was framed as well. It, it, was, it wasn't framed as the media is lying to you about crime. The media is blowing this up. It was, you know, the media's coverage of crime is derailing NYC's comeback, economic comeback. Yeah, as well, I, I so. felt like they try to get cute with it because they try to no. like say to you know like the, you you Adams who are say, keep saying this even this is messing up your own plans of bringing the city back. Yeah. But you know that's what you get with Bloomberg. You're not gonna. Get, I mean, it's a yeah. good. It, it's good that they brought this up. It's a lot of, that people were already kind of seeing, and we were all kind of assuming anyway that the media was being completely out, out of hand with the coverage. But. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll tip our hat to the, at least that story being published. Yeah, in the I know, media. I know. But it's a shame that they have to frame it in that way. Like, you know, what else are you going to expect to, to make Bloomberg news. essentially make yeah. you know bourgeois, make capitalists, and make people who love sure. capitalists like sure. Eric Adams yeah. actually pay attention. Like, oh my goodness, this is affecting your bottom line when you you know blow up crime like this. You know, please sure. stop doing this yep. nonsense. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. All right. So we were getting a little bit into um, some of these other propaganda examples. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about a hard propaganda, propaganda example, which is like right in your face, mm -hmm. the New York Post, Fox News, just straight up pro police, no doubt about it. Uh, and then soft propaganda, which is maybe made for a more kind of like a liberal or reform or let's change the police kind of an audience and uh, arguably a little bit more effective because they're more subtle about how they're kind of steering you back to the police. So my, my hard my hard propaganda example for this month is just something I just saw a couple of days ago from the New York Post. Again, any given day, you can find five, ten stories on there that could easily make a propaganda, you know, perfect mm -hmm. recipe. Definitely. But the the one that I saw was was actually kind of different and kind of you know bothered me a little bit personally uh, as a son of an immigrant because there is this issue of you know they're sending migrants from that are coming over the border and in, in Texas to New York City, the governor over there is sending them over here kind of as, a, as part of a political stunt to say, hey, you guys have a sanctuary city in New York City. We're going to send them, put them on a bus and just send them to New York City. So anyway, they sent them on, they sent about 40 migrants on a bus to New York City from Texas. And the mayor was here to receive them in front of a bunch of reporters. And, and the New York Post wrote a story that said, you know, um, migrants leave bus, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, migrants leave the bus out of fear. And the whole article was makes the argument that uh, because this bus had 40 people on it and only 14 showed up and they must have gotten off at some point along the way at a, either at a pit stop, at a rest stop, something. Yeah. They just got off for whatever reasons, right? Mm -hmm. They're entering this country. They're probably not trying to end up in New York City to receiving hands. They don't know what's going to happen. They're in a new country. Mm -hmm. But the Post made it seem like they wanted to get off because they're afraid of crime in this city. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. took this quote from Adams that said, you know, they were, uh, you know, we don't know why they got off, but they, they're afraid that something would have happened to them. So the whole premise for this story is this one line that Adams gives at this press conference where he doesn't even he doesn't even say it's crime, mm -hmm. but fear yeah. that something would happen to them, which if you're an immigrant or you're the son of immigrants who's ever come here, it could be like, hey, maybe ICE is waiting for me. Yes, there. exactly. ICE. And maybe <laughs> someone is there that like, you know, like, so you're trying yeah. to get off. You're not trying to <laughs> yeah. be found. You're, 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 you're kind of sneaking into the country any or you're coming in here. You're not trying to be like in the hands of authority. So, yeah. um, you know, that is not considered. And they try to marry this migrant story into their story, their unending quest to say that we're all like, you know, in this crime again. Um, and I found it so disturbing, bro. Like as a as a son of an immigrant, like of all the fears you come you come to this city, or you come to this country, right? You think that a migrant in Guatemala or Central America yeah. is reading <laughs> the, the, New York the Post. crime stats, <laughs> yeah, the exactly. New York Post, or the crime yeah, stats exactly. of New York City? They're coming here. First of all, a lot of these countries are plagued with violence yeah, anyway. Exactly. That's why yes, exactly. They're leaving. Like, oh, they're, yeah. oh, I don't want to be in New York City. That place. What are you talking? Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. It was so, and it took three writers to write this. Um, like, imagine crossing a border, going through all this trouble, and then be like, 
damn, I'm really scared of what's happening in the subway because yeah. of the New York Post. <laughs> like, I don't want to go to New York City. Like, you really think immigrants are really thinking about that? Like, come on. Like, Look, my mom came to this country in the 80s when there was way higher crime. I mean, this is a city of immigrants, right? If immigrants were afraid of crime in New York City, which has historically had higher crime in years past, yeah. this wouldn't even be a city of immigrants because all those immigrants would have gone somewhere else. Yeah, right? They'd exactly, run to like yeah. a, a, a quote-unquote safer place. So yeah. the story's completely bogus. It took three writers to write this. I'm not even going to say their names yeah. uh, because it's not even worth saying their names, but it took three white male writers to write this and it was just so buns that I, I just like was and, beside myself for for a day and of course the new york post is not like you know afraid of using just the mere presence of immigrants as in, indicative of crime itself basically but like, here they even like yeah. you know they now could say use, that know, they're part of a crime wave yeah, right that could yeah. be a new york poster any day but here they're saying that oh they even our immigrants are afraid of new york city's crime yeah. which is just as if the bogus. new york post cares about the safety and well-being of immigrants too yeah fox Amazing. news and, and new york post well-known advocates of the safety and well-being of immigrants. <laughs> yeah, okay. So so on that tip, that's an obvious propaganda example. The other one was one that was actually emailed to us um, by someone from NPR. Um, we got an email about this new podcast called Embedded, and I'll just pull it up re- real quick. But the, the story is about reform in, in the city of Yonkers and their police department. I'm not going to get into it. If you guys want it, you can go Google it. Mm-hmm. Um, it you know, the authors could be well-meaning people. I don't know them. But the story was so annoying to me for an, t- at least two reasons. One, it's been done before. Mm-hmm. This embedding yourselves in, in, in a police department that's going through turmoil. This, this police department is actually under, I think, a federal consent decree because it's had so much like bullshit in, the, in its past uh, that they're under a federal monitorship. Mm-hmm. Um, but embedding yourselves, uh, that story's been done. Mm-hmm. Embedding yourselves, propaganda 101, yeah. you don't embed yourselves with the police if you're yeah. a real journalist. Yeah. But the story was also, um, it's part of a series about like this police department that's being, you know, reformed by, by force through the federal consent decree. And so they embed themselves in their first episode talks with the, the, the chief of police for the Yonkers Police Department um, and, uh, you know, how he's trying to fix things and, and work things out of the community. So the whole piece, the whole audio piece is about, I think, like 25 or 35 minutes just talking with this, this you know, from the point of view of this, of this police chief. And it's just trying to make the case that this guy's trying to do something. It, you know, you hear from people in the street who are like, "Oh, yeah, he's trying to do something." But the whole narr- the whole underlying assumption is that there's change happening, and that this is worth talking about. This is worth this is worth exploring. And it's just at this day and age, in 2022, after everything we've learned, after all of the protests that have happened, yes. of, the, the way the discussion is that we're yeah. still talking about exactly. police changing, or that you know what are you know what are police trying to do to better themselves in the community? Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't you know on its face not a horrible piece like a New York Post would be, mm-hmm. but to me this is a soft form of propaganda because it, it makes first of all embeds yourself with the police. It, a lot of most of it most of it was through the, the point of view of this police chief. Mm-hmm. Maybe the rest of the series will be will be better. Talk about residents, but there is nothing in there at all that challenged anything. Mm-hmm about why police should be there's one part that talk there, there is a part that talks about there should be other services besides police for people who are having medical episodes but that is so obvious bro yeah, like yeah. we're st- that isn't even like you have to do new reporting yeah. like you can't yes, just this story has been done for this decades this has been done decades. for decades yes. and, and so, when you see people doing this story over and over first of all it's NPR so I really didn't expect much, anything very good or radical here yeah. but when you do this story you're kind of keeping us in the same loop over and over yeah. A lot of activists have pointed this out years before. When you keep us going in that same circle over and over, yeah. you're doing the work uh, of our enemies because you're not letting us kind of like progress to something. Uh, I think a little with a little bit more power, a little bit more radical mm-hmm. to change things up. So, this story, at least from the first podcast, was soft propaganda. Um, you know, it's this NPR, so you know the kind of crowd that they're looking for. It's yeah. probably more liberal. It's probably more like let's let's really change the police. Yeah. Um, and you know, it was just, to me, it's just, it, it actually does more harm in some ways than the New York Post because the Post, you can kind of like, if you have half a brain, you can kind of realize these guys have an agenda, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but NPR, you're thinking like, oh, this is like a thoughtful piece and it yeah. keeps people stuck in this thing. Like, how is this change going? What's this, ch- what's the change going to happen? And it's from the police, uh, the point of view of police department and it's called embedded, yeah. like embedded. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the mistake number <laughs> yeah. one. And, and like you said, like you would think like after the 2020 protests, the uprisings, like there was a little short moment in time where people were like really questioning the, the necessity of the police as an institution and stuff like that. But ever since then, 
the the backlash, the reactionary backlash against those uprisings has been to reassert essentially the necessity of the police and to essentially take us backwards to these kind of fucking stories, like stories that, like you said, we, we've been doing, we've been hearing these stories for years, decades, but this police department is really doing a great job of reforming themselves and look how great they're the police of the future. And then every time it happens, that police department will end up in a few years doing some atrocity. How many times has the LAPD had this kind of story yeah. done on them? The NYPD had this kind of story. To be fair, the, they used to call Bro Bratton a reformer. Right, Remember that? Right, right. You kidding me? Like, so to be fair to these people, it, they did. They, I think that they thought that they were trying to hold the police accountable with some of the questions they were throwing at this chief, and um, you know that's that's probably what a lot of reporters think that there is like the best that they can do. Maybe mm-hmm. is to try to like catch this this police chief. Uh, but part of it was also like they were talking to uh, they were talking to this police chief in a way that um, you know was was kind of like putting him as some kind of like a like a victim like the police department mm-hmm. was like we we're forced to go on these calls to deal with people who are emotional with emotional issues mm-hmm. um, you know like yeah. this is not, we don't want this either like yeah. it kind of put them in a in a sympathetic view like the police are being made to work too hard yeah. by having to do these calls. Maybe fair, we should help them by giving them, finding someone else to do it. Like, yeah, yeah. bro, it's no, not the be, police. To be fair, the cops don't like to work, but they do love the power and the jurisdiction that, that those kind of, these kind of things in. They love to be able to crack down and smack, smack a, a, a mentally ill person over the head. They love the ability to do that, but they don't just, they don't actually like doing the paperwork and the work associated with that. Uh, and unless it gives them OT time, it gives unless it's and, like overtime. And the overtime. point is, even it and they're not matter. the victims. They're not the victims, like you said. They're getting paid to do this stuff, and they they're given power uh, because they're paid to do this stuff. Like the, so, they're not the victims. And the point is, even if the cop doesn't want to do calls to the mentally uh, ill, yeah, um, it doesn't. I don't care what the cop thinks. Yeah. I care what's happening to that person. Exactly. So yeah. Don't tell me that this is hard for the police too. Yeah. That's another propaganda rule right there. If you're trying to sympathize the police, they don't need your help to be, you know, they're already on top of the food chain exactly. in terms of political power, exactly. resources, guns, badges, yeah. you know, license to kill, all of this stuff. Cultural capital. I, they too, don't, yeah, well, they too. don't need the cultural capital of, of, a, of a liberal NPR story saying like, the police don't want this either. Like the police, I could care less what the police want to do, yeah, right? Yeah. I care about what this, what's actually best for this person and that, and that police not only sh- are, are not maybe well equipped to do this, but many times they've gone in there and done the worst things possible exactly. to people who are on this. Yes. Exactly. And this article, I mean, this this podcast doesn't really go into it. Again, it's embedded. Uh, really bad start to this series. Um, you know, we'll see how the rest of it goes. But this yeah. is a to me a, was a clear example of uh, soft cop again, and I just wanted to call it out. Um, all right, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, you know, Ash, man, thank you for coming through. Let's do this again. Uh, let's <laughs> definitely do this again. Yeah. Um, I want to thank. Dennis, Robin, Omar, everybody behind the scenes here. Um, you know, we'll definitely do this again. And, uh, we're, you know, follow us at copwatch.media. Follow us on copwatch.media. Follow yeah. us on uh, copwatch underscore media in, on our Twitter handle. Um, and, uh, yeah, just keep in touch with us. And, like, again, if, yeah. you, uh, if you check our Twitter thread, we have a call for, call for pitches for people. If people are trying to write some stories uh, for alternative media. Yeah. Um, and we definitely uh, also, if you have examples of propaganda that you want to send our way, DM us or put us in the comments, yeah. uh, anything that we should be talking about for next week. Definitely. Week, help next us, week. please help us continue this work and please help us find people to, you know, tell us their stories as well too. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Peace. Peace.